We'll go ahead and call the December the 28th, 2009 Public Safety Committee to order. I'll entertain a motion for the minutes of last month. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. On the favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. First on the agenda, uh, Commissioners, if y'all remember, uh, Commissioner Williams come to us a month or two ago and with some concerns about bicycles uh, on the county roads. Sarah Lovett uh, is here tonight with Bicycle Club, and she's asked if she can come up and kind of give us some information. Sarah, if you want to come on up. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to meet with you tonight. I appreciate it. Appreciate you coming. Um, I'm Sarah Lovett. I am the advocacy chair for the Murphy Squirrel Bike Club, and I also represent the Walk Bike Tennessee Advocacy Group, which is a statewide advocacy advocacy group that represents about ten thousand or about a thousand cyclists currently. We're a new group just getting started. But um, the things that we want to um, do with our groups is begin to educate the public, motorists as well as cyclists, about the rule, rules of the road and, and how motorists and cyclists should behave on the road. Um, Mr. Williams spoke to you guys back in October with some concerns about bicyclists on county <coughs> roads um, in Rutherford County, and I wanted to kind of address some of his concerns and some of the issues that he brought up. I thought he had some really valid concerns, and he and I have met, and I've also met with Mayor Burgess, and with his blessing, have uh, come to meet with you guys to kind of go over some things. Uh, one of the first things that Mr. Williams um, talked about was an incident in Iowa where a cyclist was killed and the county was sued. I've done some research on that issue, and I just wanted to give you the facts of, of what I found. Um, the issue, what actually happened was um, in Iowa in the summer, they have this huge bike event. It's a week-long bike ride called Brag Bride at the... Um, Iowa Register puts on, and they have about 15,000 cyclists come and ride their bikes throughout the counties in Iowa. And a lot of the counties compete on if the bike route comes through their county because, as you might imagine, some of the towns in Iowa are really small and it triples their population and brings a lot of money into the counties. Um, this particular county had invited Rag Bri to come through the county and um, the accident occurred due to one of the joints in the road. as a lot of roads in the north have joints in them so that they can expand and contract because of weather. And this cyclist in particular's wheel got caught in one of those joints that wasn't properly maintained, causing him to flip off of his bike and he had a, a severe head injury and died. The cyclist wife sued the county for improperly maintaining their roads and rather than go to court, the county settled out of court. Um, the, the accident actually occurred in 2004 and 2007 is when they had the settlement and then as a result of that settlement the county uninvited Rag Bry from coming through their county from that point forward. Um, so it really wasn't um, them closing the roads to cyclists, they just uninvited that group of cyclists coming into through the, their county during the, the Rag Bry. Um, other things that Mr. Williams brought was some uh, concern about 60 riders or more going um, out in Rutherford County. Um, <laughs> as I calculated back the time period, I'm thinking that's during the time of an event called the Jack and Back, which is an event that the, most, the multiple sclerosis um, group puts on, and they leave from Franklin, Tennessee, and ride to Jack Daniels, spend the night, and ride back. And some of that route goes down through um, part of the community that um, Mr. Williams um, represents. I know they definitely go down for sales. You can see the marks on the road where they come down. Now, what if the cyclists indeed were, stop, indeed were stopping traffic, that's completely inappropriate. And um, I am working to get in touch with the directors of the uh, Jack and Back event to make sure that they express, educate the riders in the future that that not happen. Um, there's other events that come through our roads. The um, Tour de Cure, which is a fundraiser for the uh, American Diabetes Association, used to start in Murfreesboro and go to um, Mon Eagle, and we'd spend the night in Mon Eagle and then come back. We also have a very active bicycle club in Murfreesboro. We put on an event. The last three years, we've been riding in Las Casas. We leave from the Las Casas Elementary School, and we do a 100-mile ride from there. Um, and it brings about 600 cyclists into our community. So it really brings the money into the community. Um, so there's things that we can do to educate cyclists as to proper 
uh, ways to uh, behave on the road, but there's also issues with motorists as well. One of the newer laws on the books that was passed in 2007 for Tennessee is called the three-foot law, and that means when you come up on a cyclist on a county road or a city street, to pass them, you really need to give them three <coughs> feet leeway. Um, that is what the rule says, that's what the law says, and that's how you should pass a cyclist. If you can't pass safely um, by giving them three feet, then you really should just take another second or two and give the time for the road to clear or for the cyclist to, to move over so that you can pass safely. Um, I know there's some concerns about cyclists riding um, two abreast on county roads. Really, when we see cars coming, and a lot of us ride with, I don't know if you've noticed our helmets, but we have mirrors on our helmets or we have mirrors on our handlebars, and we should be able to see traffic approaching us. And if we're on a county road, we really should be moving into single file. So there's things that I can do and our club can do to make sure that we continue to educate our riders that they are obeying the law. Um, but it's also motorists shouldn't blow their horn at us. Don't blow your horn at me. That's going to throw me in the ditch quicker than anything. It scares me to death. Don't throw things at me. I've had beer, beer bottles thrown at me and water bottles thrown at me, and I've had lovely things yelled at me on the road, and that's really mm -hmm. against the law. And if I had the, the soundness of mind to get the car tag and report it, then I could file charges against someone for doing that to me. How can we make the road safer? Um, I think the number one key to making the road safer is education, making sure that the motorists of Rutherford County know what, their, what the rules of the road are, how they should behave on the road, and making sure that bicyclists also know what the rules of the road are. Um, and that's one of the things that I want to do as the advocacy chair for the Murfreesboro Bike Club is work with groups like you, like the county commissioners, like the city planners, um, getting to the education system and providing that education to um, make sure that people know how they're supposed to behave. Um, signage, um, Mr. Williams uh, talked about putting signs up, share the road signs. You see those a lot in within Murfreesboro City, uh, and Murfreesboro actually has a, um, a bicycle plan that was developed in 1994. It's like a 20-year and a 30-year plan of, um, as you'll notice, as the new roads are being built, um, you're seeing a lot more bike lanes. Um, that new road that goes around, um, I think it's Middle Tennessee Boulevard, has a bike lane now. Um, and other bike lanes are being um, improved upon. You're seeing more signs. And that's all part of the plan. Um, and Rutherford County is also working on a comprehensive plan. And if you've seen the preview to that of what the people of Rutherford County want, you'll see that there's lots of request for improvement in the multiple modality um, for tra transportation, you know, better walking um, sidewalks, better ways to get around on our bikes, um, improve the bike lanes, make sure when we're building new communities around the schools that there's safe routes to schools. Obesity is a huge problem with our children as well as with adults. Um, in November, the CDC re re uh, released statistics, Tennessee is the fourth highest, has the fourth highest rate of obesity in this country, um, and we're up there like at 30 percent of our uh, population is obese, and that means you have a body mass index of 30 or greater. Um, so when, and the reason I bring that up is one of the things mm -hmm. I heard you guys talking about uh, when Mr. Williams was talking, had presented his stuff, and you were talking about bike lanes and the cost of, of bike lanes. If you think about the cost of health care and the cost of obesity and the diseases that are related to obesity, such as diabetes and hypertension, those are the direct costs, the, the prevention, the diagnosis and treatment of those diseases, but then the indirect costs of lost work, decreased productivity, restricted activity. You know you don't feel good when, you, when you're overweight, it's hard to get up the steps, <laughs> and things that but cycling is one of those activities that, you know, that it really doesn't hurt unless you fall off your bike. It's easy on your joints. It's a great way to get exercise, to get your, um, you know, get your heart strong. But cycling is also the only way some people in our community can get around. Um, they don't have cars. They don't have the money to buy a car, and they, they travel by bike. So we need to make it safer for, the, for our citizens to get around in our community. Um, on, on their bikes. 
So the cost of adding a bike lane or putting up a sign is really, really minimal compared to, um, you know, it's in Tennessee, the, the medical, direct medical cost is estimated to be um, $1,840 million a year for obesity-related um, diseases. And a bike lane, a mile of a bike lane is going to cost you about $200,000. I don't think you really have a comparison there. Um, but anyway, I've given you a packet. It's got some bicycle safety tips on it that's produced by uh, Walk Bike Nashville and the Metropolitan Planning Organization of uh, Davidson County, of which our mayor is the chairman. And I also serve on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee of that group. So we work together on that. I've also included a handout of a, a flyer for the Jeff Roth Cycling Foundation. I don't know if you guys remember a couple of Februarys ago, a man was hit by a car uh, on Old Nashville Highway, I believe it was. And uh, Don Hall rode his bike to work every day. That was his way to get to work. Um, Mr. Hall was left in the ditch. Um, nobody still to this day knows who hit him, um, broke his back, and he's now in a wheelchair um, and has incredible amounts of uh, medical expenses. We were able to set up a foundation for, uh, jet for Mr. Hall's family, so I thought I'd share that with you. And also gave you a Share the Road bumper sticker. It just, it's just a good way to remind um, you and to remind your constituents that, you know, we both have the right to be out there on the road. Um, you know, if, if you're out in um, <coughs> the Rockville area or the Las Casas area and you see a cyclist, it could be me. Try not to run over me. Um, do you have any questions or is there anything that I didn't answer or concerns that you have? Anybody have any questions for Sarah? I've got one on here. Three foot long. Uh -huh. What you're talking about from the side. Uh, where there's a double line, are you, my law, can you pass the cyclist? I would think that law trumps the cyclist law, but I don't know. I don't know well, the, the details. Reason, the reason I'm asking is the Hallsville Pike is the longest single stretch of road, in the county road in the in of the county. And it's double stripe from the city limits to where it hits 96 in Milton. So you got 16 miles that I'll have to follow a bicycle if I get behind one on Hallsville Pike if I can't legally pass them. That's the only thing that when you mentioned the law, I was just curious how that applied to that because you might as well come and arrest me uh, or <laughs> give me the ticket or whatever. But I, I can find out, but I don't know the implications of that. Um, I'm curious about that. For but the, I will tell you, we avoid a Hall's Hill Pike like the plague. We really don't like to ride out there. It's a bad road for <laughs> it's, whether it's you know someone. Right, right. Like right. And we have had a cyclist hit out there, so we really avoid that. You, but I'll find, find out. out. Information on it. I, I will. Like, I prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else? I said last case, it's Jefferson Pike. Has that been designated uh, bike route? Um, I don't think Jefferson Pike is. The state has designated some roads as um, state bike routes, and you'll see a sign that'll say state bike route or bike route, and it'll have a number on it. But I don't think Jefferson Pike is one, but I can find that out for you. I noticed the, uh, the bicycle, let's say, uh, traveling. Pretty regularly, and I admire their courage. <laughs> um, it's beautiful out there. We love to ride. It is, but that road is so. It is dangerous. Up. It is. It is. But everything you do in life can be considered dangerous, That's and true. you have to decide. You had a question. I had a couple here. One of them is, these guys know me as a picky guy who's always seeing an error in print, but it's because I used to be a proofreader a long time ago. It says bicycles should write in the right lane as far to the right as practical. I believe you I meant ride. Ride, I sure did. <laughs> I will get that corrected. Thank you. Okay, and the other one is this: the statistics cited about obesity and these other health hazards are such that one of the reasons I don't think we get as far with those as we could is that people believe they have a right to get fat if they want to and as a you know pursuit of happiness 
but that costs me money. No. Right no. out of my pocket. No. Oh, but it does. If I pay no. Medicare Medicaid tax. It, it doesn't in the sense that it doesn't cost you any more than anybody else pays in Medicare or Medicaid tax. And if the person wants to indulge, they've got a right to. And otherwise, you're getting into dictatorial policies and that sort of thing. And this is where you always get into controversy and they rub up against each other. And frankly, I applaud your emphasis, but I don't think it's enforceable. I wasn't trying to enforce it. I was just trying to make a point of the cost of one obesity other, one versus other the problem, cost problem, though, of and this really doesn't apply if we're considering just the county. But there are many riders who, unlike members of your organization, don't obey. They ride on the sidewalks. I see them right here in the heart of the city, cutting across against a red light with a, you know, with cars coming and other things happening there exactly and riding right. on the sidewalks. And that's the group that we need to focus on for education. That that's the very group that needs to understand what the rules of the road are for cyclists as well as motorists need to understand what the rules are. But you are exactly right and how to get to those folks because they're typically not members of our club or members of organizations where we can reach out to them. So there are, there, we do have a lot of work to do, but you're exactly right. Those folks do need to be educated. And one other thought would be a requirement of some form of licensing and registration to ride on the public streets and roads. It's one that wouldn't be popular. I'm not saying we need to have it necessarily, but it's something that could be done. It is certainly something that could be done. And I wouldn't be completely opposed to it if I knew that the funds raised for that went completely and totally to bicycle safety, bike lanes, and education. That might be a way to get some. Yep. Well, I just wanted to raise these things Thank because you. they bother me. They're not clear cut in my mind. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Sure. I want to ask you, that with the Iowa situations you talked about, these organized ride events for that y'all do, mm -hmm. I've not been on the bicycle side, but the motorcycle side I've done a few times. Right. Do y we sign basically releases of liability. Uh, I know I've held a couple events and I have people sign. Do y'all have a sign-up? process as well yes we do uh, the Murfreesboro bike club is insured by the League of American bicyclists and any anybody who participates in one of our weekly organized rides or one of our pay events they sign that waiver releasing uh, the Murfreesboro bike club the the event that we put on in Las Casas is through the elementary school and we have a waiver that releases the elementary school from any liability as well Just just with that opening the floodgates up with help happening in Iowa, I'm just thinking aloud here that we don't need that same release done. If if you've got a scheduled event that's going through Rockville or Las Casas or Jefferson Pike, that we have something, uh, they're going to sue us anyways, but uh, uh, they've kind of opened the floodgates. Is that, was that a federal or state lawsuit, do you know? I think they sued the county. So state. I, that's all I that's Mm -hmm. Y'all encourage certain bike routes to, to take these. Yes, we're very conscious of how tra how much traffic there there are on the roads, and when we do our weekly rides and our our pay rides, we really try to make sure they're on less traveled roads. And we also let um, um, police the police force, the sheriff's office let we let them know what our route is going to be, so that they can um, help us patrol as well. And we let the EMS know in the counties. The, road, the Hot 100 that we do from Las Casas actually goes through um, Rutherford, Cannon, and Wilson counties. And so I coordinate with all of those um, safety groups. Commissioner uh, Ronald, he may have a question. I, think. You know, I didn't know if his, if his concerns had been addressed. We've met. Yeah. <laughs> is, the, is the route he was talking about, is that? Is that a route that y'all It's promote? I believe the route that he was talking about was um, the Jack and Back uses that route, but we ride out there as well. <clears throat> Ronald? Uh, I would just like to continue with some more dialogue. Ms. Lovett and I have met and 
chatted with a lot of people. I mean, I'm just trying to gather information, but I think that at some point in the next few months that I'd like to borrow Mr. Sparks' uh, word and have a, some sort of ad hoc committee that would meet once, twice, three times and come up with some recommendations that everybody could agree on. I think uh, Ms. Lovett said she'd be happy to chair that. <laughs> I don't know if she didn't say that. <coughs> but anyway, to kind of get some information out to educate people, and if we do nothing more than to put some signs up and to address uh, more favorable roads or less favorable roads like Jack was talking about, there are a lot of roads in the county that, you know, bicyclists may just say, oh, this looks like a neat road, but uh, it might be traffic count or number of accidents or there's a lot of things that you could compile for information that would be good, but I think that uh, with the growing number of people in the county and hopefully the growing number of uh, people in our exercise, that that would be something that we could, in a few weeks or a few months, come up with some recommendations and, and put something together that could get some press maybe uh, about what would be favorable for people or less favorable for people and just more of an inf uh, information and some guidelines as a worst case scenario. So I would think some committee would be uh, maybe formed and I guess it would be you guys on the public safety or y'all would help form that or something. But that would be my only uh, hope that we could come out of this at this point where we can get the information. That's something we can probably put together down the road. Thank you, no pun intended. Huh? No pun intended. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Smyrna Rescue Squad. I believe you got your report in front of you there. It's, um, the, um, MBAs is 46. Uh, we had no extrication in the last three months that was done. Um, first aid standbys, which consider, uh, you know, football games, anything like that, uh, is eight. Search and rescue, which is two, uh, one being, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Kittrell, uh, when the elderly man come up missing. And the other one, we just got back from Alabama on the state of Alabama called us to come down and help them. Um, 17 trainings, um, eight events, which probably would be considered hand practices, stuff like that. Um, maintenance is 15. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Uh, I guess the repairs on trucks and all that. Four fundraisers, uh, five meetings in the last uh, three months, and traffic control, which would be um, five things we did for the city of Smyrna. You talk about maintenance. Yeah. Fifth, number 15. Is yeah. There, is, I, was there any time any, it was out of service? No, sir. No, sir. Not out of service any time? No, sir. I guess probably what they're considering maintenance, just, you know, general everyday maintenance on vehicles and stuff. And my maintenance officer, he, uh, he comes down periodically and does stuff. I didn't even let me know about it, so. And he just jots it down and puts it in my desk. And the secretary, uh, she prints all this stuff up for me. You've had, you've had, maintenance, you had 152 miles of 15. Uh, maintenance was uh, 66 and a half hours and 182 miles. So it probably means the mileage going to get parts or, oh, you okay. know, whatever for that. How often do you, uh, just, is it just very irregular, I would assume, very irregular, if you, if you go out of, say, or even out of county on search and rescues? Just uh, you, know, you get called every time they have one somewhere? I got a call Christmas night asking us to go to Alabama, and I told them that we'd be up there Saturday morning, first thing. Um, that's the rarity on the, going out of state. Uh, county, 
It just all depends on TARS, you know, if TARS has any call outs or anything. Did, when when y'all went, did they reimburse you? No, sir. No, sir. The only thing they did was took care of They fed us when we was up there. They didn't reimburse you for your fuel or anything like that? No. We didn't ask for no reimbursements. We was just happy to go up there and help. Anybody else? How was y'all's y'all's lease? Y'all are leasing from the Church of Christ now? Building? It ends 2017. 2017? Mm -hmm. I believe it ends uh, the month of June, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It's either June or July of one. Anybody else? When's your next ham breakfast? The third Saturday in January. There's not any more questions. I'll entertain a motion. A motion to approve the, the rest of the squad's report. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Y'all have a great Thank you, too. Thank you, sir. Pause. Well, you're passing that out. Did you get you get the email from Steve Burris today? From okay. cha Channel Three. Okay. Yeah, they're wanting the uh, third week feature. Third week feature. Kind of get some stuff out about adoptions and stuff from Channel Three yeah. for the city. Sounds like a pretty good idea. Yeah. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> this is our November report. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary. If you notice, the intake still is low, uh, which is a good thing. A total of 571 animals came in in the month of November. Um, we had 134 adoptions, 51 animals reclaimed. Uh, the adoption reclaim rate for November was. 30%, uh, euthanasia rate of 62%, 164 animals at the end of the month still on hand. And then on the activities, we received a total of uh, 1,341 requests for service. A number of those completed were 1331. And a breakdown of where those calls originated from. And then you have the monthly mileage for the officers. <coughs> On the fiscal to date, we have had a total of 4,067 animals come through the facility, 788 adoptions, 247 animals reclaimed, 2,810 euthanized. Our uh, for the fiscal year adoption reclaim rates at 25% with euthanasia rate of 69%. And then on the fiscal year activities, 7,397 calls received and uh, with carryover from previous where it's 7,449 calls responded to and completed since July 1. And we have the mileage for the uh, fiscal to date. <coughs> On the rabies exposure bite report for the month of November, we had 28 bites reported. 11 of those animals were tested. None of them were positive. Uh, and the other exposure, we had two reported and tested, one skunk that was positive, and that was killed by someone's dog out in Eagleville. The other listing down at the bottom for the positive, that was actually an unsatisfactory uh, dog bite where the uh, owner shot the dog, and uh, the specimen was unsatisfactory for testing. And then the last three pages are just the uh, comparison charts. Uh, graphs for intakes, adoptions, and activity. You'll notice that <coughs> adoptions are about where they were last year for the month of November. Uh, just a couple, a total of four different. The intake, while still on a downward slide, uh, still following that same chart and as far as going down for the month of November it seems to every year go down it was good to have some low numbers uh, unfortunately we'll probably start coming back in though where we start going up after the holidays yeah, yeah. anybody have any questions for Tracy 
If somebody has one, I've got a, uh, I know Kim and Ken Honeycutt, the Santa. Yeah. The, the going around the to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I think they took up a lot of donations for. Uh, we helped us quite a bit. Uh, a lot of really good supplies, foods, and toys and everything for the animals that yeah. came through that event. I know they didn't do it for the acknowledgement, but I thought it would be fitting that. Uh, was be brought out definite for. success and something we were very pleased to be chosen to participate with them, partner up with them, and hopefully it will become a regular event. Anybody else? <clears throat> I'd like to ask one. When you have 7,397 calls received and 7,449 that means that you didn't cut off at the end of the preceding month. Correct. You're going to have calls that carried over from so previous that, months. So a lot that times these will never, well, I won't say they'll never match, but they won't right. be expected to match no, sir. on a regular basis. No, sir. You Thank may have you. investigation calls that are follow-ups that have generated more uh, trips out to a location uh, for investigative purposes or trap calls. Sometimes they're held over just waiting on traps to become available to get those delivered to People have requested. That's all I wanted to ask. Tracy, what are you doing to bring kind of awareness for adoptions and I guess you'd say pet people just taking care of their pets more um, responsibly? Well, we have uh, several of the officers go into the schools and do education programs for the children on responsible pet ownership and uh, fight prevention. We also have uh, several websites that post all of our animals. There is a link to Pet Harbor on the county's website that leads to all of our animals that are available for adoption. People can also go on there to look for lost pets or post found pets uh, through PetHarbor.com. There are also, I believe, six or eight other sites that our animals are posted on as well. Uh, and, and also, too, I was just speaking to her before in the city of Murfreesboro, uh, Channel 3 uh, emailed herself and, and I to, today, <clears throat> and they're wanting to put something on in the city uh, a program that talks about adoptions and, and things like that. Like so. a featured pet of the week. Uh, I have not spoken to him yet. I just received his email this afternoon. That's something we're going to be looking into as well to get the word out on the city channel. How many how many uh, dogs have been euthanized since I guess what is that uh, July first? Is that four thousand? Since yeah. July first. I'm looking at the right report here. Let's see. Since July 1st of this year, the number of dogs euthanized was 784. The uh, number of cats euthanized, 1,806. And then others, which would be uh, so some of 20, your different. Yeah, yeah 2,800 animals. Mm -hmm. So basically, killed. I mean, you know, I hate to be politically incorrect, but I think people just need to be aware of, of that. You know, I'm not a big animal lover or nothing, but. It's just sad when you when you really see. It's sad. You stop thinking about it, you know. And you know, a lot of it. You'd be amazed at the number of animals that come into the shelter are picked up as a stray that no one ever comes looking for. Even sometimes they'll have microchips or tags, and we're still unable to locate an owner due to the information not being kept up to date. Uh, phone numbers, people move, uh, never registering their microchip. They've taken the time to get the animal microchipped, but failed to register the chip. And therefore, there's no way to really track that person down in many cases. Anybody else got any questions? If there's no other questions, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Motion to have a second. And a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. sir. Drug court. Who? Don't see Mary. She's not here. She's on the leave. Okay. All right. We'll tax officers. How you doing, Bart? Doing great. Huh? You bring us some good news. Yes, sir. Always like that good news. In the black. All right. So Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't have anything specific to, to uh, report on. 
I'll answer any questions. I do have a couple of things I'd like to ask you. If, when y'all get time through that, look at the reports. I'll, I'll skip over going, going to the schools and the wheel tax. Yes, sir. Schools have, have kind of leveled off, Gary. They, uh, uh, I guess maybe 20, 25 a month now, something like that. And I guess there's people moving in, you know, picking up. But that is level off considerably compared to what it by, by them, can you give us a number about them going out and, and, and enforcing that through registration of how many we actually uh, call? We was, o we was over. We was twenty five and six hundred when we when we then we put this out, you know, mm -hmm. and we went back. We went back. Now, not not five or six hundred. It was all in violations, you know. Some just hadn't had not changed the address. Several, I say, hadn't changed the address. They had the wheel tax, but the address showed the Cab County or something. But they had got the wheel tax and, and stuff like that. As far as me putting a percentage on that, and I, can't, I hadn't put the pencil to that. So, you know. So it's a worthwhile campaign. It's helped me to minister. I think That's so. All I mean I, to I, I, you know, I, and I hope we're going to, like I said, we're changing form a little bit. We This was the first time out of the gate. We're going to change it a little bit uh, where it makes it a little easier on them, a little easier on our department, picking them up and reading them how we're doing it. So. I think it, it worked. You know. Well, I think it was a team effort between the, sure. the school sure. system. We and had to have all. We couldn't, and we, have done, we couldn't have done it without them. We got a very, very much participation out of it, too. I would like to ask y'all, I, 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 uh, litter, of course, litter is, is always going to be a problem for us in any county. Uh, and the mayor's has provided us a, a we lost a, a good friend, Gene, and he passed away. And his time, still has some time, and the McNolan let us have one of his employees to fill that into that, and it's worked, worked great and a, with our part-time. What I would like to ask y'all, and I hadn't talked to Mac about this, and Mac has never turned me down on this, is we, just for instance, we at Rockvale, we're picking up a road, and our trailer gets full. Okay, what I would like to do is carry that to that convenience center, Rockville, and put that trash over in that bin instead of having to go all the way back to Walter Hill and stand in line for three hours and I lose the rest of the day. I don't get the road picked up. Uh, and we won't bring him anything that can't put in. We won't put anything in the dumpsters out there that county can't haul or animals or gas tanks, stuff like that. I just like that to be where we could if, if that's possible. Like I said, Mac has never turned us down on this and it's worked great. Uh, we picked up Crana Road uh, uh, Wednesday. We got about two and a half miles down Crana Road and we had a load. I called him and he let me go over to Crana to dump. We ended up three loads off of that, three trailer loads off of that road, one end to the other. But it makes the time so much faster so we don't have to go back and lose that time to go and make a to the, uh, uh, and it all goes to the county. I mean, it goes to the BFI. We just like to have that if we could. Right. And I'll talk to Max some more on it. It's all right, this committee. <clears throat> I think that's going to be, it's going to save man hours. Sure, sure, sure. And more the time that they're out there picking up a road, it, it's helping us all. Right. It's making both county look better, and we get more done. We get more places took care of. You know, we're going to have the problems that we normally have. And I do want to max uh, crew the litter at these uh, Sam's Club, Kroger's, and stuff like that. Mac has been so much on top of that, and I think the county is hauling some of that. That has cut a lot off of me. He, he has took. Either we got the message out that we're going to get in your pocketbook if you catch it and catch it, or they, and we're putting some signs up too. And I think that's helped us tremendously because it's, I know it has me right. because I don't have to uh, do that. Uh, Miss Lynch would like to invite all of y'all, public safety and all commissioners, 
down to the new motor vehicle officer if you haven't seen it. It's it's something that this county is going to be very proud of. The mayor has designed it, helped design this, how it's looking. It's something we've needed a long time. And I think we're, we're going to be really proud of it when it does. But uh, we'd like you to come down and look at it. It's in the stages where you can see what's going to be where, you know, and it's on time. What they say it's on time. And uh, but we are proud to have it. If you want to uh, anybody to like to come down there, would like for you to come down there. That should be very beneficial. Yes, it official. is very beneficial. Yes, official to the north end of the county. North end of the county. The the uh, uh, emissions is right there by it. So, a person he can get two stones at once right there. Yes, it. And business tax too. He's going to have. Yeah. He's got. You know, it's been a big. It's going to be really nice. Really nice. And I hope in the near future, I know it won't be this year, but I, I would like so much to have another officer where he could just be smarter than Laverne. If he, could just, if he was just at that end of the county, just work that end of the county, I hope we can do that in the future, get an employee down that way. You can see that, that uh, titles are down. You know, that's, that's the reason people are, they're not buying new vehicles. They're working on their own. And, you know, I hope that gets back up. I sure hope it does. I hope we still increase these other figures more than what they are this month. Completed the uh, Rose County School Buses uh, inspections in the last month. It's one of the worst years I've ever, since I've been doing it. <coughs> have ever had. I don't know where it's, times are hard, people are not spending money. Uh, we hadn't got to the rough county schools yet, as soon as the state lets us know when we want to do that, we'll go through that, but we've done all the rough county school buses. Is it all one contractors with? All one's contractors with. A lot of safety violations? Yes, sir. And, and, and it's not, you know, it's people not, I, I don't know where people are not it's the same every year. I mean, they should know what it needs to be. And I don't think they understand, and we're trying to get this across, is if you're going to fix it before we let you pass. So it, it takes time. If it's not fixed, you've got to come back to us again. That takes another inspection. You know, it just takes time. You know, I, at, at, at what point do y'all, or does whoever, if it's a bad enough safety violation, to shut the bus down? That day. When it comes through that line, in other words, we took 10 a day. When it comes through that line, if it's a safety violation, you shut down then, and it, it has to be fixed before we can go back. In other words, it stops right there. Is your AM still shut down? No, no. But what I realize is if I shut you down, you've still got to get back in line the next day and come back around. you got to inspect you again. That just takes time, personnel, you know, and in which the state don't have and we don't have, you know. But, you know, I, I we're working on... Uh, I, I hope we're working on some things that a change that this, this coming year. Uh, but we do have safe buses. Yes, sir. Okay. Every, every, uh, 203 buses passed. Every one of them's passed. Okay. You know, uh, we're going to go back and do some spot checking during the year. And that's not only in Rutherford County, but that's county-owned buses that the schools own. Yeah. Like I said, we hadn't got the schools yet, but we will get them before. And uh, daycares, that too. Okay. Anything that holds people down. Anybody got any questions for Bart? Got a motion to have a second. Second. Got a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Well, yeah. Thank you all. What you do for me, things you do for me. Mm -hmm. Wish y'all happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Juvenile detention. <clears throat> I think you got that report here on the desk. Oh, sure, yes. <clears throat> uh, what we have uh, tonight is the monthly report for November 2009. Uh, 
should be able to be very brief. There's nothing uh, particularly unusual or concerning. Uh, the only thing I would say is that there, we currently have three agencies that we're waiting uh, for payment from, but they're not behind and they're not over. Uh, an unusually high amount just happens to be three agencies that we're waiting to collect money from. Who are they? <laughs> I can get the information to you, but I don't have it with me tonight. Okay. But I'll be happy to answer you know any question that I can. <clears throat> when I'm in the state, is it? No, we don't contract with the state any longer. Okay. Anybody have any questions? If there's no questions, I'll entertain a motion. Move. We have a motion to have a second. Second. And a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Anything else? Thank you. Oh, uh, I'm going to move OSHA report down like it's talk to Amateur Service. We made uh, 1,558 calls for the month of November. That's down about 200 calls from normal. Average response time 7.2 minutes, and there's 26 coroner's calls. We have billed $945,768 and collected 436310 which puts us on a projected yearly collection of 5.259 million. We have insurance write-offs, $283,388, and collection agency write-offs of $55,970, and <coughs> the county um, discount of $692. How is that working for you? I know we, we changed up the, the, Bill. the billing and stuff. How is that working for you now? Working out pretty well. Uh, as you can see, the, the discounted amount as compared to last year is uh, almost $6,000. Right. So, um, and uh, we're actually making fewer of those calls. <coughs> the table at the bottom of the page is the, the <coughs> operating costs for ambulances. We didn't have any breakdowns this month, but we did have some pretty significant repairs that you can see in that column. We drove a total of 29,553 miles, which is also a few miles less than we usually travel. That's because of the decreased volume. And the last thing on that page is the number of calls responded to by out-of-zone ambulances, which is a total of 257. The next page is just a, a brief accounting of what we did in the way of in-services and training and uh, special event standbys and the training for the special operations team. Response time report was on the following page. Number of calls for each ambulance station, also the response time for each station, and a little bit more information there. Our critical transport team had 43 calls. Support truck made 81 calls. And the following page is the number of ambulance calls broken down by commissioner districts. There's also a table there for the transport team calls. 
for some reason Stonecrest Medical Center was down this month. Uh, typically we'll do about as many at Stonecrest as we do to Middle Tennessee Medical Center. So I guess that's just an aberration. I'm not sure anything's going on here. So the transport team made 62 911 calls, I guess for an ambulance that was busy in another zone or something? Do you see the need for one out there? I see the need. But I know funding. I know funding I understand that problem. part of it. Uh, we but, have, have uh, so you projecting maybe the next one that we get as it, stand, that as it stands right now if I had to make a recommendation that'd be where it would be um, and that has been in our plans all along as you know um, but those plans are on hold until I guess they come right back. I understand that part of it. thank you and there's a a few notes there on the back that we received from various people. It was, it was a situation where a, a child was injured and ultimately uh, expired. I thought that was pretty touching on the part of that family to write that letter. Uh, yeah, they're, they're from the Murfreesboro area. I can't tell you exactly who they are, but it's because of different violations. So. Does anybody uh, else pick up coroner calls except y'all? Reason for that would be you and the other paramedics are, are county corner. Debbie Corner, you're the county corner. I'm the, I'm the corner, and all the paramedics are deputy corner. Uh, we started that program, oh gosh, back in the eight in the. Actually, we did it two different times. We did it for a while in the 70s, and then we were out of that for a while, and then we saw a need to go back and start doing it again in the 80s. Um, most other counties in the state of Tennessee have, have copied program that we have here. So it's worked out pretty well. Um, Dr. Bart Warner is the medical examiner and we do primarily do the, the initial stages of those investigations for him and, and he works very closely with us. So. Anybody else have any questions for Mike? No other questions. Entertain a motion. So moved. Got a motion. We have a second. Second. And a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mike. Correctional Work Center. I don't know. Do they distribute a copy of the next Yeah. There's one. The number of inmates continues to run between 220 and 235. And it's functioning under difficult, stressful circumstances. Okay. All right. Do I have a motion for the r report? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. And a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Sheriff Department. Report. How are you doing? It's fine. How are you? Doing good. <coughs> Got your Christmas shirt on. Yes. Hope everybody had a good Christmas. Still full. <laughs> We have two budget amendment requests. The first one 
is to recognize the revenue from the JAG 2009 grant that we're sharing with Murfreesboro. Uh, the amount is 46721 Going into our data processing account, this is to be used for video arraignment in, Joe, in uh, Judge Bragg's court. And the second is to transfer money within our budget for $6,000 into our repair and maintenance equipment in the jail account. Anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. questions? Got a motion to have a second. second. And a second. Discussion. Seeing none, call the roll. Commissioner Black? Yes. Commissioner Daniel? Yes. Commissioner Hall? Yes. Commissioner Cage? Yes. Commissioner Schaefer? Yes. Commissioner Sparks? Yes. Commissioner Farley? Yes. There's a report. And we just have the report. Anything in there that kind of jumps out that we need to know about? No, sir. Not yet. Do I have any questions on the report? If there's none, I'll entertain a motion. We've got a motion to have a second. second. And a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Emergency management. Thank you, Jeff, for the report on here. major on here, but there's a few things I want to just bring your attention to. Uh, one is we've been working with the hospitals and some of their planning and, and uh, training in their decon operation and receiving contaminated patients. And uh, uh, we've worked with both uh, Stonecrest planning for the next years, what they need. And uh, we just finished some uh, training with the uh, uh, Middle Tennessee Medical Center on their decon operations. Doing a lot of training for the uh, volunteers uh, on the hazmat side, and uh, we've been uh, working with uh, uh, Southeast Rutherford and the nursing home on a possible uh, training exercise out there sometime this next year. But that's uh, we're in the planning stage to see what can be done. But that's all the, the major things that are in it. Then Larry has some roll-ups on the, the fire side. Uh, in the next page, you see my report. <coughs> the only thing I'd <coughs> like to point out on there is I have uh, met with the supervisor over EMS dispatch this week and uh, trying to create a policy where if the county volunteer uh, fire departments out on a, a fire scene have a working structure fire that EMS will dispatch a unit to stand by on the scene in case one of our firefighters do happen to go down or, or have an injury or anything. So uh, make sure that they're covered medically. Uh, but most of the time we have sword on the scene. They do a lot of the uh, filling of the air packs and air bottles and stuff, but a lot of times you have, uh, matter of fact, we had a guy that they get his twisted his ankle on a fire out in Christiana, and they, they were there to treat treat him. So that's just something that uh, they approached me about. And I, I told them I thought it was a good idea if we if we have a working structure fire where there is uh, actually going to be uh, set up firefighting operations that we would have an EMS unit stand by on the scene. And then the next uh, page is our fire call call volume. And then total on your water usage and the next page shows all the water usage for each that each individual apartment used Randy Gross does a lot of stuff. Is he able to get out there? 
No, uh, <clears throat> Terry Smith uh, from uh, he's a instructor from Tennessee Fire Academy. He taught that class. Uh, <clears throat> he taught uh, that was a Saturday class that we had at the OC. Uh, in that January the 16th and 17th, I've got uh, an instructor from the. Uh, I've got two classes right now going through the Tennessee Fire Academy. That's going to be brought to Rutherford County. Uh, I'm working on a third. Their grant classes. One of well, two will be through a grant class, and one will probably cost the volunteers so much per money per student because of it's a, a pump operations class, and we really need that in this county because we have a lot of knob twisters, but not a lot of engineers. So, but uh, the class in January is going to be uh, arson for the first responder, and that's going to be taught by uh, a guy from the Tennessee Bomb Squad and uh, from the state be down here that day. And then I've got a pump intro to pump class March the 20, 20th and 21st. And I'm trying to set up a uh, class that the Fire Academy have here. Both both of those are two-day classes. And I'm trying to set up a class February that would be a health and safety in, incident officer. So that, that'd be a two-day class. And I, that's a grant class. So I'm trying to uh, find something out on that this week. Hope we get confirmation on that. The last sheet is the, of course, the training schedule that we've been going over with y'all through the year. Um, as uh, Mr. Hall pointed out, the protecting evidence uh, for fire determination was uh, December the 12th. If you look down at the bottom, the total uh, Rutherford volunteer fire departments had 10 in our training this year. We had 160. We had 36 that would come out of, uh, out of town, which is from uh, 4th District over in Winchester. As a matter of fact, they sent me a real, a real nice letter thanking me for allowing them to come over to get such quality training. But uh, I told them as long as you know we don't have uh, a full class from the Rutherford Fire Department uh, attending these classes, that as long as there was room, they were welcome coming train. But that is the total, and then uh, I've got three classes set. Hope three classes set up for next year, and then trying to finish up the whole schedule, which we will have on our website. And I sent out emails two or three times a month reminding them of these classes and when they'll be and, and what the times are and uh, attachments for the uh, application they fill out. That way I'll know how many we're going to have in advance. So, uh, hopefully trying to just give them as much training as they can possibly uh, have time to, tis to participate in. That's good. I, I, I like to see that number there. It's 160. That's 160 that didn't have a four. Well, we have 321 volunteers. That's 11 volunteer fire departments and four rescue squads in the county. So if you if you deduct, uh, I don't know what the actual members of the rescue squads are. What did I say? Four. There's three, excuse me. There's three rescue squads. Well, four if you count sort. Uh, but if you deduct the, the membership out of the rescue squads to the 11 volunteer fire departments, then that, that's that's a pretty good average. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things they... That night that we met with them, that they had talked about that they wanted, and uh, and I say they're getting it. It's well, good. one of the things that bring these classes from the Tennessee Fire Academy, it also gets some accreditation to the academy. They get certificates from the from the fire academy, and a lot of these classes are put on through the National Fire Academy through the Tennessee Fire Academy. So they're a little bit we're gone from we've gone from a basic firefighting training. To uh, the next level because what the fire academy has done is allowed us as instructors to be able to teach the basic where they can go through and get their live burn and get their state certification. Right. So uh, we, we're doing that on the side too. Matter of fact, we just got, got through. I just got through helping Rutherford put on a, a rookie class, and I'm gonna probably gonna do another one in February. Uh, of course, that's just 175 dollars. I think the last cast has, has decided to sponsor it. So it will be actually be free to the, the firefighters that want to go to that class. So Vascast is going to sponsor for all of us? Yeah, they're going to sponsor a class, and that will be for anybody in Rutherford County. Rutherford has done two classes last year, and I, I would imagine they'll have another one. And th I'm assuming these are these classes for the whole year is minimal cost to the, to the department. And these, zero. these classes are free. Larry's done a great job in setting up this training. And the training that they're putting on is all quality certified training. It's uh, it's not just somebody, hey, I know how to operate something. Here's what you do. I mean, this is excellent training, and and we're hoping that next year we'll get these numbers to go up of more of the 
volunteers to come, but keep in mind, they also get training in other places. Right. So it's not that this is the only amount of people that are getting trained. They're, oh, they're yeah. getting other training too. Well, yeah, of course I help instruct too, but the instructor that I use is actually a instructor from Tennessee Fire Academy. That's what he does. So, I mean, he's, he's volunteered to help us and put on these classes for free and just trying to, because he lives here and he wants to see everybody train, hopefully, uh, you know, keep somebody from getting hurt because of lack of training. All these, the classes here are uh, either at the Kittrell facility or at the center yeah. on if they're, Col West College? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. If it's a hands-on class, like something we're we'll actually going to be doing practicals, uh, pulling hose or or firefighting, whatever, or whatever it practical may be, hands-on, it's at Kittrell Fire Facility. If it's a classroom setting, then we have it at the EOC. But I'm I'm trying to, as you see up there at the top, it tells you where all these classes are held at, and I'm trying to use that facility as much as I possibly can because it's really it's really a good training tool. Uh, well, what kind of programs does Eagleville have out there at their facility? They must do Eagle? some Eagleville. Yeah, cause I'm just looking because they don't come to the other ones is why I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Allen said about that they have some of some of the facilities. I, I have to make an assumption that some Eagleville's the, got well, something out there. Some of the uh, some of the fire departments do training at their stations. Uh, matter of fact, I've had several requests from the chief of Eagle for for command uh, instant command classes and stuff like that. We put those classes on and didn't get a response. So I can't, I know for sure some departments are training and I know for sure that there's a couple of departments that don't do anything. But you know, I can, I can get, put water in the trough, but I can't drag them to make them drink it. Okay. Yes, sir, because that's what they record is, what we put down is what they, what they send us. So district that'd be district forty five. Their training hours are ninety ninety four point five is what he got listed. That's supposed to be actual hours that they'd spend training instead of man hours. Springtime, just to, just to, you know, just to find out, because I, I, mean, you know, I, I mean, the people, you want them to have it, you want them all to be prepared, because uh, the people that are dependent on them, I, you know, I have to make an assumption. Well, they too, if they're not trained, they stand a better chance of getting getting killed. Yeah. And the with the help of Senator Ketron, there is a law that's been uh, that's been signed in, into law that they have to have the basic 64-hour live burn uh, within three years once they join the department. And I think that goes back from, what, 2004? If right. they were if they were hired right. back then, or they started back then, they have to have that, that training. They have, can have the 16-hour class before they go to a, a uh, any kind of structure fire, which that's very minimum. But with the 64-hour uh, class and the 22-hour live burn, which actually gives you over 80 hours, it, it better prepares them to do what they need to do out in the residential area. Did you compare our fire departments at Kemper to what they were, say, even five years ago? I mean, we've made a quantum leap as far as training personnel that are capable of taking command at fire scenes, knowing what to do, people that know how to operate the pumps. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Part of it, of course, reflects back on what he's doing here. He's doing a real good job. You know, one of the main things that they had problems with the training is is getting it out in their facilities. And he's made that an offer to them. So, you know, they can't come back and say, hey, I don't have this training because he's going to come right to their door and get it to them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not there at, at, at the better facility that to hold it. I'm a state certified instructor through the fire mm -hmm. commission. So, you know, I've offered if they need classes or want to have a class, I'm off to come to their station and teach them. I have done a little hazmat. Uh, EMA office is putting on the basic hazmat operations, which is a 32-hour class. We put on one of those at Walter Hill, and then we're doing another one in April at Southeast. And of course, that is 
for anybody in the county to attend. Those classes are free. Uh, our instructor with the MIA State Mayor does instant command classes, and those classes up through uh, TEMA, they're free. So, I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities out there for them to train if, 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 they, if they want to, and if they have the time. Well, how many days a week do you work? Yeah, anywhere from six, six to seven. But the, th the problem is I have to be available for them because they right. work during the day. So what time I put into the office during the daytime, I have to be there at night, too, if they, if, if they need be. Because they, you know, I have to work around their schedule. These classes here on Saturday and Sunday? Those, those classes are on Saturday. The classes I was telling Commissioner Hall about in the, in the spring, January, February, and March, will be two-day classes, and those are on Saturday and Sunday. Because that's the only time they're available. They work a job during week time. Some of them work maybe day shift and afternoon shift, but that will allow them if they're off on weekends to attend those classes. Okay. I make a motion to approve the report. Yeah, motion to approve the report. Do I have a second? Sir. And a second. All in favor, the motion to say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Yes, Mr. Shaver, I've got this. I'll check on your pattern. Right. And as soon as I get, find out if we got any of those, I'll let you know. Okay. I figured a lot more of us than we got that letter. But well, actually, back in uh, November, I set up a meeting with Consolidated. They came to uh, the chief's meeting, and they actually give each chief a hydrant list of every uh, hydrant in their, their district, the hydrant number, what the GPM gallons per minute that those hydrants pumped. Or, or have the water pressure, and then actually with the name uh, of the brand of every hydrant in their district. So it shouldn't be a big problem to go back and check to see if we have these in our system. Is that the thing we all got in the mail? Yes, yeah, about the hydrants yeah, it's freezing up. Boys freezing up. CUD, they have that. Yeah, they got all that. So I, I can check them and find out what, what we need to do on that. Okay. You got anything else? You have um, the Tiger Hill. Come check. You're going to do Tiger Hill. All right. Tiger Hill Communications Tower. Okay. On that. Um, we have requested through the state forestry on, on getting part of that to the top of the hill, and uh, they have agreed to a lease, to a long-term lease, uh, a section of it. I do not have the lease agreement back yet. Um, I'm hoping to have that any day now, but they, it's gone through the board, and they uh, called me and said they approved it. And what I'll, I'll pass this picture around. It shows the, type, the fire tower and the building and the two buildings and what's in yellow is what we uh, had requested and got approved for the, the grounds there for uh, uh, making the hub of our communication system. I mean, if y'all remember back a while back where we've had some dead spaces throughout the county and through the fire side, to the police side, through uh, EMS side and everyone's, we've had some, some uh, some tire issues. This issue right here will help. It's not going to take care of it completely, but it's 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 one one leg of the correcting the measure. Uh, starting out right here. It's the hub of our communication system, being uh, where it's located in the county, and it's it's it will definitely be the the beginning point um, of improving the overall communications. We had a uh, a a contract, to, a use contract or agreement to use the tower, the fire tower, and we've been using it. We have a couple antennas on it, but what we have gone into for this long-term lease agreement is to the approval then to remove that tower, put up a regular communications tower and a communication shelter. And uh, they were gracious enough to uh, agree to that, and we're waiting on that uh, contract to come back. And this is proposed to be Grant money, correct? But what? The tower and all the repeaters. We have that. we have grant money to put a tower up, and uh, and we're hoping we'll be able to get all this going uh, quick enough to use it on the 2008 grant. Once this, this proposal, it's got to go to the state, right? Already, already has. Already, it's already been there. It's already been there. Mm -hmm. The other thing. That, okay. What, what I was going to ask this board. Um, for the permission for the mayor to sign 
all of these agreement contractual stuff that we need to execute this uh, and pass it pass it on instead of delaying it once this is passed through the necessary channels it's got to go through what's the timeline of this being up and running I can't give you a timeline and the, and the reason for it is we have to do environmental study we're doing the paperwork on that now and that gets approved that's the delay once that is approved then things can move quickly All right. once that's done how so, quick is quick <laughs> well we have the money for the tower already on the grant so it's not that like we have to appropriate money at all we have that for putting that tower we already have the construction contract ready to be executed when we get the environmental study finished right okay. we're, we're hoping we're on that site to see how that's going to affect the dead spaces on the different channels we, we probably roger should tell him if if you remember some months ago we put together a, a committee of our experienced people to help us study this and they have studied this this is just one tower site there are our county is is ringed with three or four or five other tower sites that we're going to share and use over a period of time so uh and they have done these studies commissioner that show exactly how yeah. what percentage of coverage we get it's it's way up there i mean this but it takes this tower plus about three or four more towers that we're going to partner with hopefully one in Dave in Williamson County for example and we're going to use Middle Tennessee Electric's tower they've approved there's a site out at uh, near the Cannon County line that uh, CUD has a site there and they've offered to let us put another tower there so you're going to get presented to you their final report in a few weeks probably that will show over a period of several years we'll need to spend maybe as much as two million dollars plus to really get to where we need to go but we need to start the journey and every year start putting pieces together so that at some point over some period of time we'll have this thing really built out to really be very, very effective. And that's kind of where I was heading a while ago when I said this is the first leg of the sound of the cash where you have right. hopefully have five or six towers <laughs> around the county to cover any area that, that you don't have any coverage in. When that report's released, when we have it all, then we'll be bringing that to, to this committee, too, as public safety, and saying this is the findings of that committee. Well, several years ago, we had started looking at this, and I was on the plane, and I requested that, you know, anytime we approve the cell tower, that we request them to use that site. And, of course, they didn't really want to do that, because it it limited, but as we got into it, we found that the federal government will actually build the tower for them as long as they will let it be used for public safety. And we followed up on that or being able to use those federal dollars to <clears throat> for these cell sites. These cell sites, I mean, I'm, I'm not an experienced person in this, but I can tell you they're not strategically located at the right elevations to accomplish what needs to be accomplished, and they're not at the right height to do what we need to do. We're talking about a tower here that's probably 180 feet tall. Yeah. Well, probably got 40 of these around the county, so I'd say that there's probably at least one or two that might be, it might be. strategic location. Now, I can tell you, the people that are on this little committee are, they know where every tower is in, in Little Tennessee. <laughs> they, they were all looked at. <laughs> and they, yeah. they have not mentioned any of those in the few meetings that I've listened to their discussion. Well, on this particular one, what dead spots is it going to take care of? We approve this one. This is one of five tower sites. and. When we have that full report to be able to give to you, you, you'll see and have the mapping on how all, all five of them would work together. Are you doing any specific testing is what I really want to know. I mean, are you actually going out and saying, okay, at this height, we've done testing, and this are the areas that cover, and these are the dead spots that are taken care of? Yes, sir. They are. How are you and actually doing that testing? They're, they're doing it with a... Uh, uh, well, part of it with radios and part of it with a, a computer system that you you use for identifying uh, RF frequency sites and locations, heights and elevations and, for and putting this, up radios. And this committee is doing this with their expertise. Yes, know. sir. It, and, and I don't doubt anybody's expertise. It's just that I've proved tower after tower. I've still got the same dead spots I had <laughs> 10 years ago. And, you know, I want I want to see from your report before I say yes, I want to jump on it and 
get on board with these, what it's going to do and how many of these dead spots are going to come out of there. I mean, we've built towers on the north end of the county to take care of that. We've built them over uh, out Manchester area to take care of those areas there. Out at Eagle, we'll take care of that. Like I said, I'm still seeing the same dead spots I saw. What time? What time? We don't really have any towers that we've built, and we well, don't. Do we have a tower out at Eagle that we're using. I know ambulance station was using one at Eagle for a while. We're not. We didn't build one out there. We didn't no. use one for a while. That's not one that I'm aware of. I mean, I know Middle Tennessee Electric no, has got I, one. We're in, not using in, it now. And that part of uh, Lynch Hill and uh, is primarily the one that we've got. Quite a bit of stuff on. We have Lynch Hill, and <coughs> right now and on Tiger, we have and that little on tower that. there is only about short 60 feet or 80 feet tall. Is yes, it? sir. Even right now, I've done testing out in the county, and there's only probably one or two spots in this whole county where you cannot get out on mobile radio. Now, the problem is everybody wants to be able to talk on a handheld, and that that creates a problem. But on a mobile radio, you can you can get around, or get get back to Peter on anywhere in this county except maybe. One place on the Highway 96 is off down in a hole. Uh, so they are able to talk on their mobiles. Sure. <coughs> Sheriff's Problems has the same issues we have because the day I went out and checking these sites with uh, the supervisor of dispatch, the SO told me that these spots that I, I identified, they had the same problems with SO. And this committee is looking at all public safety frequencies. I mean, I've been shoulder to shoulder with the deputy, and both of us trying to contact dispatch, and neither one of us being able to get out with our mobile units. I mean, that's why I just want to make sure that those places like that, you know, we see it. We talked about it. It will, it will take it will take all of these towers over some period of time to, to accomplish ninety nine point something percent. I mean, uh, and it's going to. But every time we do one, it will improve. But it, it's going to take a building block process to make it really what we must have eventually. This this lease doesn't cost us anything, but we will be using some homeland security money to put the tower up if that's uh, if that's what you want us to do. But this this is the key. Every one of the people on that group that's been studying this this is an absolute must. This location right here. The repeaters. That's going to be like for the volunteer fire departments and the SO and the AMS and all the ones that are going to need this. Is that money going to be coming from the grant as well? Not, Not necessarily. necessarily. We don't have all this money identified. All we've got right now is enough money to put that tower, the tower. Up. Okay. And I need, out of the grant money. Right. We're going to have to fund some of this ourselves over a period of time to make this happen. I can't really tell you what the final thing of that report is because it. it it hasn't <clears throat> been presented to the whole committee right. yet. But when that's when it is done, it, it the system, and when it's all implemented, should eliminate dead spaces throughout this county in public safety. Uh, according to all the documentation, according to all the professional testing and verification of the public safety frequencies, and that's UHF and BHF, or volunteer fire to sheriff's office, ambulance service, it's all been checked and double checked and triple checked and run tests. But as the mayor said, it's going to take time to mm -hmm. get it all implemented because it is an expensive thing. And it's not changing everybody to 800. It's using what we have, but using it with better equipment and more or, or methodology of how it's going to be transmitted. Well, when we get this report, we will let the uh that committee come at least as many as they can right. and let them give you a lot more of the technical information and, and bring some documents and some uh, that show the coverages I mean they they pre mm -hmm. prepared those and have developed those so uh, and I know that a couple of people on there on that committee have got some quite a bit of knowledge and experience on this and years of experience and they they're very knowledgeable about this whole process and what's happening in our county and, and other counties and and they graciously volunteered their time to do this. They did. Well, there's a been discussed about a mobile repeater, as far as because of these areas and the years that mobile we're talking about. Mobile repeaters have been talked about, yes, sir. What's the estimated cost for a single mobile repeater? It it depends on the type of UHF or VHF. Okay, EMS has got them on each one of their ambulances, a mobile. But they still have bad places too. Right. Uh, it, it's not the answer to everything. I'm just. Well, 
All we're asking to yeah. take what, you know, Commissioner P. I mean, I'm glad we've got this. I don't, you know, the, this, this is this committee's a new thing since I've been up here, and it's, I think it's getting us way far ahead than where we've been in the past. But um, where are we going to come up with that money? And luckily, we've got USC there to fund some of this. But uh, I was just thinking of like that a mobile repeater that we could get on a service company or something that would uh, if a bad structure fire happened out you know in Walter Hill or Las Casas or Eagle or somewhere that it could roll and open things up. Well you're talking something different than a mobile repeater. Okay. What, what you're talking is a uh, like an uh, ICRI uh, that can go up and the small the power tower, yeah exactly right there for hot it. spot. And and we do have uh, that capability and um, and it's possible that we may have to uh, get some more of those. Uh, you're talking about a $6,000, then the radios to go with it. Where do we have that capability at? Uh, well, Tommy Brown has one in his vehicle. We have one in the mobile command uh, capable, and we have a uh, uh, SU-1000 that's on right now. It, it's up at Lynch Hill that uh, is capable of doing that, but it's a big unit. So if, if the, the monies, if the needs are that they need to get more of those, then that also can be done. Okay. I didn't know how much they were. I know that was one of the things we're having to look at because in a building, you know, we're on 800 and smart and- 800 has a major problem. You're in a building, you're done. Yes. If you're doing a handheld, you're done. Well, I think what, what there, in some some cases, well, what you're talking about is when through plans review and different things like that, that say it's a high rise or whatever, that, that person at that time through plans review could be required to put in some kind of repeater on that on that building. But in the county, we're not going to have those type of. Right. Because uh, I know we have problems here in the city mm -hmm. that when we get into that building, like the. Mm -hmm. 15-story building is bad. Well, metal buildings play havoc with uh, signals anyway, for the most part. But all we're asking for right now is the ability to accept the lease. Right. We gave them a lease, and, and, and it's, they just make it one or two modifications to that lease. That will give us the right to use that piece of property to take down that fire tower and if and when you approve putting up another tower or equipping the tower, that piece of property we will have in our hands for 50 years. So that's that's the primary thing that we're trying to achieve here right now. I think this is a good start on the problem that we've got. And uh, like I said earlier, it's the first leg of, of fixing the problem that we that we have. And I'd entertain a motion to approve this request. So moved. Second. And a second. Zero. One. Is there any need for the county attorney to approve? The county attorney has already, in fact, he prepared the okay. lease that we submitted to the State Building Commission and they accepted our lease. They want to add a couple of little things to it. And, uh, any more questions? All in favor, motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. All right. Happy New Year. Thank y'all too. All right. We're going to move to. OSHA report. We'll get you report at first. Yes, sir. Again, I, I know the people here tonight, that some of them come in, they will probably thank you if they do. Hey, <laughs> Y'all volunteered to. And maybe it won't take as long as we thought. Well, we do have a few things tonight to present. First thing I want to do is present the uh, OSHA report for the month of November. Um, I have for you the uh, accident frequencies. Uh, for the month of November we had a total of 13 injuries requiring medical attention. That brings the total for the year to date to 227. As far as OSHA recordables, the total recordables for year to date is 150. They break down so that uh, 50 of them have restricted days claims, 39 were lost days, and 61 for all others. 
On the next page, just want to uh, present to you the graphic depiction of this year's claims versus the last two years. So give you a moment to look at that, just see how we were doing. And on the next page, for the total of the 13 claims, we had total dollars incurred of $43,540. And that breaks down that uh, for the county general, we had six claims, and the total incurred was $8,200. And the Board of Education had seven claims, and their incurs were $35,340. And that's the report I have for you at this time. Any questions on the report? Work that's Claims draft. Yes, sir. We got June, July, and August starting or above the trend. Yes, sir. Why would that be with the schools out? Looks like we have a lot less workman's comp claims. Uh, people out. Yes, sir. Um, we're working, working to educate. Uh, this past year, the schools did a lot of stripping. And the manner that they used to strip <coughs> the floors actually caused additional injuries. And we had a number of injuries at the schools. So it was people that were still working, not teachers. Were That's correct. They were custodians down. that were stripping the floors and uh, uh, doing work outside for the uh, grounds. Spike shoes to wax next year. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could. Yes, sir. We're working with. Uh, the Board of Education knows to address those concerns. Any other questions? Is this part of the report too? No, that's okay. All right. I entertain a motion on, on the report. Do I have a second. second? And a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, the next page for you to look at is a, a little bit of look at the financial uh, results of our change from a workers comp environment to an on-the-job injury environment. If you look at that first box up there, you'll see the claims that actually went through the Rutherford County bank account in order to pay for work-related claims. And in 2008, you can see the total was about 1.4 million, and in 2009, about 1.3 million, which is about a 7.5 percent reduction uh, moving from 2008 to 2009. Uh, it, that's a nice reduction. Uh, we would we would hope for a little more. However, it's important to remember that again, these are the actual dollars that went through the bank account. So in 2008, you're paying claims back from 2007, 2006, 2005, and in 2009, the same thing occurs. Uh, we would hope to see that those numbers would go down further as we get further into the OJI program and and start closing out the old workers' comp claims. But then the next line down is very important to note. That's the reserve change. Uh, the reserves are money that are set back to pay for future liabilities on existing claims. And if you'll notice, in 2008, when we were still under the old workers' comp program, we had to increase our reserves that year by $465,000. But in 2009, after we had switched to the on-the-job injury program, the actuaries reviewed the program, and they actually reduced our reserves by $820. $28,000. Now, we'll only have that, that magnitude of an adjustment one time, but we would hope to see it continue to decrease, just not, not in huge chunks like that. Uh, but then there was another cost to the OJI program, and that's the long-term disability insurance that we purchased in conjunction with the OJI program. This is a new benefit for all of our eligible employees. It's not only for work injuries, it's 24-hour coverage, so people can be covered if they injure themselves at home as well. Uh, so the net cost of these programs in 2008 was $1.9 million, but in 2009, only about $894,000. And you can see that's a significant decrease uh, from what we had seen in, in prior years. Another way to look at this is this other little box that we have up here called the incurred claims. If you'll see, in 2008, we had 235 claims under the old workers' comp plan, and under in 2009, under OJI, we had 238 claims. So we had a little bit of an increase in claims. One thing to remember is that our population is growing, and so our exposure is growing as well. However, we are encouraging people 
to report their claims. Um, so things that may not have been reported before, we're asking them to report now so that we can address them from a safety perspective, so that we can go out and do training where we see a need and uh, try to get a handle on these things before they become serious. But now look at the incurred drive, incurred excuse me, the incurred dollars. In 2008, these dollars, this $1 million, was actually um, dollars, incurred dollars for claims that were incurred in that year. So from 1108 to 123108, we incurred a little over a million dollars in claims. In 2009, under the OJI program, just OJI claims alone, incurred from 1109 to 122709, because the year wasn't complete when we looked at the data, we have $464,000 in claims. And that's a huge decrease. We're only at 44.8% of where we were last year. And you're wondering, well, how did we see that kind of a decrease, you know, while we're still taking care of our employees? Well, again, the safety training that we're doing is uh, helping us to control the cost of the claims. While we're getting more claims, we are we're decreasing the severity of them. But then also the long-term disability insurance was a huge driver in this because it takes those incurls and any long-term expectations for income replacement, which we pay now under, o under the workers' comp program, that risk is transferred over to that insurance program. And so you can see that a big portion of that savings is directly related to the purchase of the long-term disability coverage. So, And that's what makes the on-the-job injury program a success for the county. We're focusing on safety. We're trying to mitigate uh, injuries and control them to the point of, of keeping the severity down so people aren't injured as badly. But then we're also using risk transfer tools such as insurance in order to try to uh, uh, control the costs. So we've actually given employees long-term disability that they didn't have. We're still taking care of our employees with their own job uh, status. And we, st and we save $1.1 million by doing this. Uh, we saved uh, about eight hundred ninety four dollars. Yeah, that we did. Pretty good deal. Yep. If I may, the next page, a couple months I came before you, and we talked about the OGI program, and I was asked to take away some questions. I'd like to go back and study that on the drug testing program. Um, this next page is or section here is a review of the, uh, the drug testing results and the drug testing we conducted over the first nine months of this year. During that time, we had 194 claims uh, that were uh, received. And out of that 194, you'll notice going across there, drug testing was conducted in 168 of those within the first 24 hours, within the first uh, 48 hours, we add another eight to that, and by the time we had reached the three-day period, the 72 hours, we had accumulated testing of that 194 claims to equal 94.3 percent of the claims. Now, why is that sufficient to, or uh, significant that three days? Underneath that, if you'll look and see, we actually test for five drugs. The five drugs that we have listed here, and we also have the uh, drug testing laboratories their results or their, their time period that say that they can actually detect drugs during that time. You'll notice that the average of that going out there is three days or 72 hours. So with, uh, with that, we're able to uh, test all those claims, 194, and be able to get 94, better than 94% of those claims tested within the perimeters of that, uh, the results that they have. Now. Of those 194 claims, just to kind of, again, to continue on, we had two positive tests that came out of that, which means that we're only getting about 1% positive claims. But now, that should not uh, make us feel bad. That should reassure us that we are doing the testing and that we are getting good results. Uh, we have a lot of professionals in the county. Plus, also, just to be reminded that the drug testing is part of the Tennessee drug-free workplace. There was some discussion about uh, testing all employees, reports only, and things like that. And I just want to touch on that at the bottom of this page. If we had to, to look at testing of report only claims, we had 156 report only claims during that first nine months. 
of those handling costs for a report only claim is $35. And then so that makes the total cost for those 156 claims $5,460. If we should decide that we're going to test all claims and go back and test all the reports only claims also, then that's going to convert those from report only to actual medical claims because we have to, again, the way we treat those in the handling process. The uh, cost of that goes up from $35 to $135 for each of those claims in order just to do the handling of that. The test, uh, the cost to conduct the test is on average $35. There are some that are a little bit lower, some that are a little bit higher. Need to also just mention that the, the drug testing for the ER is also uh, a great deal more expensive. But on average, what that would do is bring that out, those claims out to about $26,520, which is roughly five times what the cost is at this time of handling a report only claim. One thing that I could not bring into this is on a report only, we have individuals that go in or decide they don't need the treatment right now, so therefore they don't bother to go to the doctor for that treatment. But if they're going in for the testing, then they might say, well, I'm already here. I might as well have it looked at. So there's going to be additional costs on medical costs, and I have no idea what that would do to this number of these 156. But what I would like to, to bring out to you is that we are getting Nine, better than 94% of our claims are being tested within that window of that 72 hours. What's the time frame on testing now? We test when they go to seek medical treatment. So if uh, uh, somebody goes on the day of the injury, they get tested that day. If they go two days later, then it's going to be within the 48-hour window that they got tested from that. But right now, 94% 94, 94 of the claims are all tested so within the same. They may, unless they receive medical attention. That's correct. Right, and, and the, the thing about the report only is that still makes them very valuable to us is we still look at all of those, again, to, from a safety perspective. Are we seeing a pattern? Is there something we need to go out and investigate? Um, and is there training that's necessary because we're having so many report onlys in a specific area or for a specific reason? Now, what I would like to do is bring up to you and tell you how we stack up to other uh, counties or agencies in the area, and that's what you're going to see on this next page. Uh, I've listed here Rutherford County, the town of Smyrna, the city of Murfreesboro, Williamson County, and Sumner County. And what I'd like to do is just take, for example, the first column there, post-accident testing. If you look to see what Rutherford County does, we test at all for all workplace injuries at the time of the injury when the employee goes to the doctor. The town of Smyrna does actually does the same thing. The city of Murfreesboro contacted them. They test all safety-sensitive employees at the time of an accident, and they test all motor vehicle accidents. They also allow one additional test is when the employee requests to be tested following an accident. That's specifically when the employee requests it. If the employee doesn't request it and doesn't fit into either one of those windows, then that's not receiving of the test. Williamson County tests safety-sensitive positions at the time of the accident, and Sumner County tests safety sensitive positions at the time of the accident also. So that tells you how we rate as compared to the others. If I may address the next column over, reasonable uh, suspicion testing, uh, we do conduct by, uh, testing for reasonable suspicion by department. Sumner, or excuse me, uh, the town of Smyrna tests all employees. Now, ours is done by department. All right, explain what, what do you mean by, by department. Uh, the sheriff's department would be the one that would conduct their testing. The ambulance service would be the one that would be authorized to do their testing. I'm not authorized to go in and test randomly within other departments because of uh, elected officials and things like that. They control the te those types of things in their departments. Do we all use the same uh, lab? No. That's all dependent upon each individual department as to how they, they run their testing for that. Now, uh, the city of Merce, like I said, uh, the uh, town of Smyrna tests all employees. So does the city of Murfreesboro. They test all employees. Williamson County and Sumner County do not test for reasonable suspicion. 
Lastly, I'd like to just touch on the random testing. Uh, Rutherford County, we do uh, random testing for safety sensitive and CDL positions. Town of Smyrna does random testing for all employees. The city of Murfreesboro also does testing for sensitive and CDL employees only. And Williamson and Sumner counties do no random testing whatsoever. The significance of this, as I wanted to bring out, is to show you that Rutherford County has a very robust program and that we capture, as I said, 94% or better claims right now in the drug testing program. Uh, following our discussion, what I'd like to, to uh, recommend is, or say is that we'd like to keep the testing program just the way it is that we have at this time, considering the results that uh, I bring back to you from that, that discussion we had previously. That said, so it requires an injury for you to do a drug test. Yes. What's your feelings as far as the town of Smyrna has all MV, uh, motor vehicle accidents as well? What's your feelings as far as that? If it's a motor vehicle accident, then if there's a work related injury, they are tested. If there's a motor vehicle accident, there's no related injury, then it's up to the individual departments to conduct that test. Well, what does this mean in that third column, random test event? By department. Yeah. By department. Say so. Yeah. But some. But that means if you're in there, you could be tested at any time. Yeah. Right. Yes. Those. Yes. I mean, that's up to the department head how they conduct the random testing. What? I mean, what's your feelings? I, I kind of wish it was in there just because of the. Um, for instance, if it's a. Uh, an accident in Smyrna involving one of my police officers or a fire engine or something, we have to call an outside agency in to do that. So their procedures and our procedures can get lost in the shuffle. But if we have it in black and white, what, like I said, all MBAs, we know we've got to go to the urgent care and have a, a drug test done, be it a utility guy or police or fire or whatever, that if we had it in black and white to where we just require it, on all that it would be taken care of that way. I guess my question would be do we have any very many motor vehicle accidents that don't result in a claim? While there may be a few, there are very usually not very many as far as that. I mean if there's uh, somebody gets up and walks away from it report only in a motor vehicle accident and the individual gets up and walks away, the employee and he says I know the only I don't need treatment then there's there's no test in that result. And as since it's not requiring medical treatment, I not don't have the ability to... Is that employee or somebody involved in an accident? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So that, that employee, because we test on the... On the as if I hit you and it injures thing. you, but I'm fine, and I don't get tested because I'm the county employee, right? That's correct. I don't have the ability to test yeah. you under my... On, on Murfreesboro, that, that's, there's another qualifier in there that's not really on here. I mean, the, the vehicle just has to be disabled, and you have to... Be, and there has to be uh, an injury to someone on, on the scene, whether it be the employee or the civilian or, or citizen. Or, or someone's, I think, killed. And the one thing we need to remember when, 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 when you're discussing this is that, that we, our department has control over the on-the-job injuries. But we don't have control over uh, determining who is tested if there's no injury involved. So um, uh, well, no you might run into divisions that, that would prefer that it stays the way it is. You so. could have also have a, a department that if no one's hurt is in the accident, nobody would, would test. Except That's true. By, by department. That's true. true. It could happen that way. That's by doing it by department is uh, mm -hmm. the, the kicker here. That's correct. They don't test it. Just so you, if we had an ambulance or a patrol car sitting at a red light, somebody rear ends them, no injury, 
you still test your officers, any passengers in there. We do, Andrew and I'm Andrew. We, we one yes, one no. That was what well, Mercury Yeah, exactly. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, you yeah know, if you exactly. Had a fire engine full of, you know, four, four men, and, uh, they got unit, them. and they got rear ended, so all of them would be chasing. Yeah, they got them. Yeah. So, the change you'd like to see is you'd like to see on any vehicle accident. No, I was just looking at it from an investigative side that you're building your case and if there's a suspicion that arises later from an incident that we've not already covered our bases, but it's two-way street. If you, if you do things to uh, uh, cover yourself or if you don't have it in writing and don't do it at all, then what are you liable for later? So it's a two-way street. It's just, I, I just... Like I said before, what's their opinion of how they felt about that? Because I know y'all discussed it and talked about it. Seeing what I, I mean, when you've reached out now and gone to Murfreesboro and Smyrna and everywhere else, checking mm -hmm. on and seeing what they're yeah. doing, I know you've discussed it. So I just was interested in what y'all's feelings were about it. I, I tell you something shocking to me in, in, in this study that, and it's not it has nothing to do with brother, anybody in Rutherford County, but Williamson County and Summer County. With the million floors they've got, there's no reasonable suspicion and no random testing for anybody. Yes, sir. And I double checked that. That's Ashton for right there. What do I have to do? Uh, all I could say is is that they had some issues trying to pass it through their commission. No uh liability issues I mean apparently not sir okay if if there is their um, insurance providers are aware of the circumstances under, under the the uh, and it, it's leaving me here the you just said it want to go the state um, drug free workplace. Drug -free workplace yes sir getting that a requirement that's written in, into it that um, especially the post accident testing yeah. uh, I believe the others are only uh, required for safety sensitive employees, so they may not be participating in the drug free workplace. Work yes, sir. And by doing that, that's costing them. It should cost them money, money. because their liability rates would be higher. And that goes back to what we were talking about the insurance carrier that's aware of that. Well, I'm not a taxpayer in Williamson County, Summer County. But I did want to come back and I wanted to bring this to you as to the questions that were asked in a meeting a couple months ago where we stood and uh, present that to you so that hopefully I could answer all your questions on that. So, Dan and Lois, y'all feel comfortable about leaving this the way it is? Yeah, I think we have come so far in the past year uh, and made so much progress. And, and to have 94.3% of our claims uh, with appropriate drug testing going on, I think that's, that's quite an accomplishment given the fact that we didn't do any drug testing this time last year. And, and, and please remember that when we say departments, we're talking about other elected official departments. So we have made remarkable progress they have in getting everyone to participate here. That's correct. How do we lie with our county-owned vehicles that say the uh, fire department's high and they're involved in an accident? Are they... We, it really, we're turning those over to them, and but yeah, they're, they're not going to fall under any of our stuff, right? No, they don't. Right. They all they're, have their own policies. They have a million dollars on They got five million dollars. Well, yeah, well, yeah dollars like we do. Imagine that, but I just, that's it. Dan, did y'all not see any savings that could be accounted for on a, on a threshold of, for, a, for an injury? I mean, a minor injury. You're saying they're still going to have to be drug tested. Yeah. Well, it, it does come back to trying to make sure that we standardize things. We don't want to start out and think a, an injury, say a minor injury, and we don't test them or for something like that. And then next thing you know, we, you know, six months go by, and now all of a sudden it's a major injury, and then we're, we're looking back. By being consistent in what we do, then we don't have to worry about second-guessing ourselves later on. 
There's no other questions on that. We'll move on to the next one. Okay. Uh, the last thing we came to you, brought before you the last time, a revision to the OGI plan document. Uh, there was some additional input from a, another department head that uh, we wanted to evaluate. We went back. We've uh, taken their information. We've also incorporated parts of that into it. We'd like to present this to you tonight. I would like to let you know that this was presented to you uh, uh, by a, a, not, excuse me, a unanimous vote from the insurance committee. So they've all uh, already seen it and passed it. Uh, some of these uh, changes you're going to see the document you've already seen, and I'll uh, touch on those as we go through. On page two, the first change is in the middle of the page, and that states FMLA and all others. That's an old change. That's one you've already seen, and basically that's to allow this program to run concurrent with all other HR policies as per the county handbooks. On page uh, four, at the top of the page, we have uh, this is another change that was presented the last time. And what this does, it allows the uh, law enforcement officers and a man emergency management responders. And one of the things we did, we dropped the word management to read emergency responders. Okay, it's not limited just to the management. To uh, elect whether they want uh, any diseases of the heart or hypertension to be listed as an OGI injury or as a regular medical claim to their health insurance. Uh, the reason for that change was that some individuals uh, felt that they might be more comfortable seeking their own physician rather than going to an on-the-job injury physician, and they wanted the option to be able to say, I would prefer this under my regular health insurance rather than taking it under the OGI program, and that's the change that we have here. That, that was presented the last time. One new change is the next paragraph underneath that. You notice we've added the, the words Tennessee Code, and that was just for clarification. Before, all we had was the numbers there, and we've added to make sure that we have the Tennessee Code and the subparagraph that goes with that. Uh, another new change that we have is in uh, rules number one. Uh, what this change does, first off, it maintains the current shift reporting of reporting of an injury within the current shift. However, it, when you read through that, it does allow for some injuries that need time to manifest themselves to be reported within an addition or a maximum of three days. Injuries that may need time to manifest themselves would be something such as a spider bite that somebody would get. They would just see a prick, and obviously by the end of the shift, you wouldn't even might not even know you got that. But Within a couple of days, you would know you'd had the injury, so this now allows that uh, additional time to do that. Also, the thing that this still does in this paragraph, number one thing is it goes beyond, well, it goes beyond the three, three days. It still uh, maintains us the ability to do our drug testing in a timely manner, but it also allows us to make sure that we maintain our safety controls. It allows us to go back to resolve any safety issues in a timely manner rather than having them extend very far out. And that was one of our most important concerns and how far or how much additional time we allow, and that's how we selected the uh, three days. And one other thing we looked at is we, we've had some timely filing issues with folks who, because the current rule says that you'll, uh, you'll report immediately or within your current working shift, and we have had some issues for people with timely filing. So we went back to look at what the parameters were around those. This three days, captures all of those. So if people were to, to report it once they started having an issue, it would have been captured within this three-day um, this three-day exception process. So not only then are we still able to investigate from a safety perspective, we're still able to do our drug testing, but uh, all of the issues that we've had thus far through this year would have been caught within that three days. If the individual would still go forward and report the injury. Right. The uh, uh, last uh, addition or change on the bottom of this page in paragraph three, uh, that allows the injury must be, uh, excuse me, uh, states that the injured employee must be participated in submitting the forms. We've had some individuals walk into their supervisor and say, hey, I got hurt, turn around, walk off, and leave the supervisor with trying to figure out what needs to be submitted, the forms, what happened, and things like this. And this is a uh, 
a joint effort with the employee and their supervisor to make sure that we, we get all the needed information in order to do that. And so we just want to make sure that the employee understands that they are also responsible for providing information. Uh, on page five, I brought this before you the last time also in number six. We changed the, the wording from seeking treatment to receiving treatment on whether or not an injury would be uh, uh, closed or denied. And uh, what that was is that's for to, uh, again, the, the intent of the wording was that individuals actually receive treatment. They may go into the doctor for another problem and say, hey, by the way, I got this. And the doc says, well, how did you do that? He says, well, I, I uh, did it at work. Well, then all of a sudden, the way it's worded now, just asking the doctor, then that could be construed as seeking treatment. We didn't want that. We wanted where they actually received treatment. So uh, that's because then they would have made that conscientious choice. So that's, again, something you've already seen on that. So if you're in a car wreck, you're driving by, you're taking over to a non-authorized treatment group, OJ, I would be denied. No, sir. No, sir. And in fact, we even address that here later on, but that's beyond your control for certain things like that. But what it would be is that, say, you twisted your ankle when you went in to see your private doctor, and while you're in there, you said, you know, my arms have been hurting me too. And the doctor starts asking questions, why is it hurting? And you say, well, you know, I hit it the other day at work. Well, that's work related. I can't address that then. So that's where this gets into that question. Um, page seven, uh, there's two things on this that were brought forward the last time. The first one at the top of the page, uh, again, it referenced the drug testing and it changes the wording from may require to will require. And basically that is to conform with the employee handbooks that the county has. Also on number eight, uh, we addressed this previously uh, on medical treatment not sought within the first seven calendar days. We initially had it stating that the, from the report of the first injury, when it was reported, we had some supervisors that were uh, very thorough that reported the injury the day, filled out all the paperwork and got the report in the day of the injury. But the program allows the supervisor two days. And if a supervisor was to take two additional days to complete that, the way it was worded is one individual would have less time than the other individual for the same type of thing. So what this wording does, the date of the injury, makes it consistent for all employees. Uh, on this next page, page 8, and this addresses your question uh, that you asked earlier. We have uh, changed uh, under medical treatment center. We initially said they seek treatment at the emergency room of the Middle Tennessee Medical Center. We've had situations come up where the emergency responder has elected to take the injured employee to another facility, possibly a facility that's uh, better equipped for the type of injury. We don't want to second guess the emergency medical responder, so we've added in there or that facility selected by the emergency medical transporting responder. So uh, now all facilities, if it's selected by the, the uh, medical people, then it's going to be us. Be yeah, yes, sir, and it already has been. And by the way, we've not denied any claims for that. It's and just it, that this brings that into line. It could be someone being laughed at and can't go to Nashville, go to Chattanooga. Yes, sir. And it makes them all covered. Yeah, we, we just didn't want to be in the middle of, of where the people who are treating go and the document. They need to be able to make that choice. Right. The uh, We have something new that we'd like to uh, add to it. And that's under the OGI uh, review and appeal process. Uh, the step one initially uh, was felt that it was very formal and might be intimidating to some county employees. What we've done, we've gone back and reviewed that and tried to address that. Uh, one of the things that we've done is take, we had a reference to a BRC, benefit review uh, meeting. What we've done is take that out and Basically, all it really was was a review. The employee came in to a meeting to meet with myself, and we sat down and discussed the accident, gathered additional information. Maybe there was some information that I wasn't privy to in the initial uh, paperwork that was submitted, and address and try and 
reach some type of understanding about the claim. And that's what we've done here in this situation. We've taken out uh, verbiage that might be misconstrued or the employee may feel that they were uh, uncomfortable with and addressed it to state that it is a review. And this is done all the way through the step one process that you see on page nine and going up to the top of page 10 that you see. You'll notice that we've taken out the OGI benefit review and it's just addressed as a review. And we've taken out wording again that uh, may not be understood or felt like it may not be comfortable to the employee. In step two of the appeal process, in the first paragraph that you'll see there, and it's highlighted, uh, that's a change that you've already seen previously. That's clarification. The, uh, we had initially said the human resource director would serve on the appeals committee. But we have some departments in the county that have their own human resource department. And so we've added the verbiage or human resource coordinator of the county's division that the employee it employs that individual. So that would actually allow them to have somebody from their own department on the appeals committee from the HR. So that's actually there to help the employee should their job title or, or job description be in such that may not be well understood uh, to help them, uh, other people on the committee to understand what's going on. We've added uh, one thing to the uh, second step, and what this is is clarification on who is entitled to come to the appeals committee. Uh, we've added that the uh, employee seeking an appeal has the right to bring family, friends, counsel, or a designated representative to those meetings. And what this does, it, again, it, in addition to to having support group there for the employee. It also complies with all court findings as far as uh, that issue is concerned. At the end of step two, as you see here, that is the end of the county's appeal process. Anything that happens to that point is final as far as the county is concerned in the appeal process. However, we've added a step three, and what it does, it is a result of a case in Memphis that states that an employee may be entitled to a judicial review if they so elect. And that's what we've added in this step three, again, as a result of a, uh, a case from Memphis. And that is the document that I have brought before you today with the revisions. I'd like to ask you to, after your review, to approve that so that we can then take it to the next budget. step, to budget. Tell you a little bit about uh, something that Dan and, and Lois have spoke about. I received a letter from an apartment head with some concerns, um, and they had also submitted the letter to, to Lois's office. Um, so down with Lois and Dan and the mayor and, and uh, the, the department head, and uh, there, was, there was some give and take right here. And I think this is actually going to benefit the county it's going, it's, it's going to benefit the employee, and it's going to benefit the citizens by not paying out, um, you know, claims out here that, that shouldn't be paid out. It's going to be paying claims that, that need to be paid if someone gets hurt. So there's been some give and take in this, and I think uh, uh, the insurance department, the insurance committee, the mayor have done an excellent job on this. Hey, let me ask you, how is a, a school bus driver, I know that wouldn't fall into this, but how, how is that determined if there's an accident? The drug. They're not covered under OJI law. I know, but I mean, as far as drug testing, we talked about that earlier. Do uh, you know? I do. We don't do any drug testing on them because they're not our employee. Um, that would probably fall under... Um, for the contractor that they work for. Now, we there is some new rules that if the uh, bus driver is the one that's responsible for the accident, uh, then then the, our liability is called into question at that point. But the drug testing, I I really can't speak about that because I don't know what they do. With going back the to I guess what 
Commissioner Farley had mentioned earlier, with, when you do have an accident that maybe it, there's not, the, the employee's not injured, it's, a, it's, a, it's an accounting vehicle, whether it's a deputy or a coach or, or whoever, um, and there's no injury to that county employee, but there's injury to someone else, will they be tested then? And not unless they file a work injury. Now, that's not to say that the department that they work for does, won't require it. I know that uh, the highway department, for example, uh, will frequently do drug testing after accidents for their employees. So, so it's not that we don't have the control over it, but the department may very well be doing that, and, and I just don't have the knowledge to share that with you. CDL. Right. Mm -hmm. The CDLs definitely do. Well, and then actually, the, uh, with the CDL license for the School bus will probably require it. More than likely. It would probably be in their contract, too. With the, the school board with the contractor would have that covered, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I 220 too. buses. <clears throat> the designees of who you gave as far as representing the county is where does our, our council fall in that? Because they are allowed now that judicial review. Where does our county attorney and well, the judicial get review is, is a separate thing from from right. from this. However, um, the the whole reason, if you'll read just a little bit further down, uh, in order to provide a timely appeal and decision by the committee, right. uh, they have to submit a list to to the insurance director five days prior to the hearing. The purpose of that is, if they're going to bring counsel, we need to have the opportunity to have counsel present as well, and that gives us the scheduling opportunity. Yeah. Now, I will also tell you that so far we haven't had any employees that felt the need to bring counsel to one of these meetings. Their meetings have just, it, it just hasn't required it. But they have brought family members, their supervisor, uh, a union know, representative. Union representative, and nobody has been denied access to that meeting that I'm aware right. of. Well, am I being too tedious to ask that as far as on the county, the OGI Appeals Committee that we have? Um, for instance, as you put down here in red, or a designated representative that we would uh, basically have a catch-all for us as well. Uh, that would be a way I'll interpret that as a catch-all for that individual who they want to come. So you've named uh, friends, counsel, uh, members of the family, or a designated representative. That could so, be the union representative as Lois spoke up right. earlier. Or they may be Would we else. want that catch-all that we're in our part of that up a little bit further? To where we would be able to have a designee to where when you say uh, further up are you referring to the step one process in the same paragraph to where it oh. lays out you basically that paragraph you're laying out two two separate entities you're laying out the county and the individual that's appealing and you've gave the person that's appealing a designated representative so anybody they want to pull basically in to testify or give uh, evidence they can bring we really I know item three allows us an opportunity, but we're not designating that in who we're going to have there. Right. Um, the, the we're specific on who we got, and then we don't have a catch-all as mm -hmm. far as a designated representative that we may choose that we want to have right. there. Item three, again, that takes place completely outside the program. We don't have anything to do with that. The employee would actually leave the county and go to Chancery Court or somewhere okay. to do that. So, But I, I hear what you're saying on, on If you above. wanted a county attorney there for this committee meeting, mm -hmm. the way I read it right now, he wouldn't be able to attend by what you're writing. Well, he wouldn't have a, he wouldn't he have have a vote. vote. He wouldn't have a vote because that's what it... He cannot he, be a member of the committee, the appeals committee. That is a committee that is designated to be a civil service panel. And uh, he could be there as a matter of advice. In, in the meeting that I was privy to and it, with with, with uh, Lois and Dan and, and the mayor, we talked about we talked about that. And actually, this committee is actually, you might say, is slighted more towards the employee because they're going to be a representative of their HR coordinator of, of that department if they've got one that's going to be there. That member of the insurance committee that is on the insurance committee with them would be from their department. From their department would be there. And then, so it, it it was it's kind of more, if you say more slanted. I'm all right with it. It's just this is all about my pay grade anyway. But <laughs> I just, uh, no, I, this doesn't preclude us from having having counsel so and designated counsel representative. Right. They just simply would not have a vote. Right. Okay. Uh, that that same question was brought up. 
Would it? <laughs> well, in summing up here, as far as the coverage goes on OJI, the bus driver that got beat up by a couple of students would only be covered if the Board of Education has provision for some kind of coverage. Is that right, where he's a contract employee? Right. He's, he's not a Rutherford County employee, so he's not covered under the OJI program. He would need to be covered under the workers' comp or similar program to the person that owns the bus that he drives. Thank you. I just wanted to be sure. Anybody else have any questions? On your new committee, step seven, page uh, seven. Mm -hmm. Are there four people that actually review that at that time? You got the insurance director, human uh, resource director, or resource coordinator from one of the other departments, and two insurance committee personnel, okay. one from that department and one at large. So there's only four. There's, there's three that actually vote. Uh, in my role as the insurance director, I uh, lay out the, the um, information that we have and uh, try to facilitate the discussion. <coughs> but I don't have a vote in it. And so there's, there's only three people that have a vote, and that, that would be the human resources director or representative, a member of the insurance committee from the division that employs the individual, and an at-large member of the insurance committee. They are all, you know, the, those two are insurance committee members and then the re human resource person from their division. Is there anyone else? If there's no other questions, we'll entertain a motion to to send this to full county commission or budget. budget committee i'm sorry any idea what the cost of this is will it be an increased cost for these changes uh based on the appeals that we've had so far i don't think so um there isn't anything that would be treated differently than 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 what we've had there might be an additional risk in allowing the three days for for the for the employee to report an injury, but it again it has to be one that manifest that doesn't that they're not aware of and that manifests itself. Uh, that goes to, to basic fairness uh, well, for the employees. Right. Yeah. If an individual was to get cut today, then he'd need to report that because it can't a cut won't manifest itself any different today as it would three days from now. But the fighter bite get bit today mm -hmm. would be different three days from now. Yeah. So that 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 part does not change. Or someone pulling the back, and then it, the next morning they wake up, and they have it. And, and they, that would and obviously it, be something there then. But uh, again, the thing is, as Lois said, it's what's fair for the employees in that situation. Right. And I think that would we feel that that is acceptable and it's fair to the employees and needs to be addressed. Right. Well, I'll make a motion that. Uh, we send this to uh, the budget committee with our recommendation. Uh, with a favorable recommendation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's a better word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to get clarification. <laughs> Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay, we've got a second. Also, too, if we, if y'all would get this to the uh, all commissioners, that way they'll have a chance to, if they have any questions, to get we all, that way on the floor, the commission floor, that will, maybe that may save a lot of, We'll definitely do that at once budgets look at Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any, yeah. any discussion? Yeah. I, I'm going to go ahead and vote favorable on this tonight. But I'm kind of like Gary. I'd like to head this a little bit sooner to be able to look over it, but I'll have time to look at it between now and budget. So i still got a question or two on a couple of things, but I think most of these are, are, are very good changes. So. Well, like I said earlier, there was, I mean, there was some give and take between uh, the department head and some concerns that the department head had, and, and, and then Lois and Dan, and even uh, Roger Hudson with the county attorney's office was there, and Mayor Burgess, and, and uh, it, I think it's, from what I can get out of it and tell, there was, uh, uh, it's, it's looking after the employee, it's looking after the, after the county, and it's looking out after the taxpayers. And 
anytime you can do that, it's a it's a good accomplishment. So definitely benefits. All right. Yeah. 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 I can amend my uh, motion, can I? I, did, I just want to amend it. To, to, I'd, I'd like to see by Wednesday um, this in all the commissioners' boxes because, well, Thursday and Friday the courthouse is closed. And I think, oh. and, it, and you know, they're at least going to have an idea then if budget does make some change in it. But they'll have, that'll give them, well, they can see it here. They can, uh, there's no excuse for them then by the commission meeting to not have read it. Because right. otherwise, it's only a week after budget before commission. In boxes by this Wednesday. Yeah. Well, you got it right here. It's just I, copies. I understand. Yeah. Make sure we understand. Well, <laughs> and I say <laughs> that because of the New Year's when the offices are shut. Yeah, it's an odd that's, situation. That's a good catch because I mean, that way the commissioners will have a chance to to read it and okay. get some knowledge. Not a problem. I just want to make sure I have when we say yeah. which Wednesday and all we're talking about. Here, so. Is there any more discussion on the motion on the floor? Hearing none. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion unanimous. Thank you. Thank That's you all. all I have Thank you all for the work on this. Did you have an extra copy of that? I do. I've got a copy of extra copy of the uh old document. Something about the already have this. Uh not until budget's done. No, I mean, I'm sure she will have to. Oh, so she will have to. Okay. All right. All right. Is uh, any other business come for the community tonight? What, what about uh, Commissioner Williams' suggestion? Where, where are we going to go with that, the ad hoc committee that he was mentioning, Mayor? Commissioner Williams uh, mentioned an ad, ad hoc committee, and I think he was alluding that it should originate here. I just I don't think you should put more than one uh, commission member on there. You would have to have a public meeting. Right. Okay. <laughs> I just didn't know if y'all want to discuss it next, next month or. Well, um. I'm trying to think how we how we can handle that. Um, I'm assuming that he will serve on. Well, that's what that's what that's what I'm. If 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 Commissioner Williams and and uh, Miss Lovett, um, I'm trying to think of who else would be. Because we we only need one commissioner on there. You know, cause we don't want to. It appear that, you know, we're having any sunshine violations. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to have everybody from the fight club on it either. So right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, sure. Yeah. Balanced committee. He could have wanted to be my next. Yeah. Safety meeting. Three to five people. And what I'll do, I'll just I'll ask Sarah Lovett and see if, if there's anybody that she may. Uh, if you could get, if you could get a, it, it may be difficult to get a, a a planner on someone with some urban planning experience. You know, would, would be would be good to get on a committee like that. I'm assuming that uh, Doug Demasi would might probably have somebody aware that has probably got some. Cause I think uh, Miss Lovett, she's been she's been working with Doug uh, Demasi on some issues as far as on the major thoroughfare plan and, and different things like that, some on the bike lanes and stuff. Sheriff's officer or Sheriff Highway Department Patrol, one of somebody like that that would deal with county roads. Man. You know, even something I even thought about this tonight. Something like, uh, and not really cost anything, but someone that may have an event, may have a, like kind of like a uh, a parade uh, permit, and there's not really a charge for that permit. That way, it goes from uh, the the person ha having the event to uh, the sheriff's office, where they're going to know. Uh, what the, the route's going to be, if it's going to be uh, unsafe, or and you may be able to change the route around to um, where they'll kind of have an idea. So, mm -hmm. I think it's good to get the discussion out there. I know uh, there's several people that ride bikes down weekly and so forth, laying in Smyrna to, to Nissan, and uh, like Jack was talking about Jefferson Pike. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine people on bicycle on Jefferson, but but I do see it, and um, you know, I think the discussion being out there to look at how they can improve some safety and. You look at that injury, that guy being paralyzed in Laverne. I mean, that's 
if that was his only, only mode of transportation, going to and from work, and then he winds up paralyzed, it's pretty pretty sad. So if, if this ad hoc committee could could help one person, it would be Let me ask this. Do you think there needs to be someone from the highway department? What do you all think about that? I definitely think there needs to be someone from the sheriff's department. Yeah, I've got the sheriff's department down here. here. A planner from the MBO has already contacted the sheriff about presenting some in-service training to the patrol officer just about bicycles yeah. and law enforcement and how that fits together, et cetera. I'd like to see that. She's already discussed that in the highway department. Uh, certainly that would be fine, too. That type of training, I would like to see televised on our county station if possible. I, think. I, have, a, I have a video of this. It's a public service announcement that I have looked at. It's, it's prepared by Davidson County, Metro David Nystro, and it's really good. It's just what we're talking about here. I would educate the public on, you know, the laws of the road, you might say. It has two or three specific references to Metro National Davidson County, but it still would possibly be beneficial here. So I don't, I have been, Struggling with whether we should just go ahead and put it on channel 19. Yeah, this fine world. Well, let me ask you this though. They said we can use it. It's, uh, it's public information. Good idea. What if what if we were to have uh, a um, a bicycle club representative, a county commission representative, which would be Ronald Williams, a sheriff's office designee representative, uh, a Doug DeMossi or a planning department uh, representative? And a highway department designated representative. That's five people. Um, and if somewhere they they see a need, they could the chair of that ad hoc committee could bring it back to to, to me, and I I can add it. Um, does that sound like a a plan? Yeah, that sounds good. What are we charging that committee with doing? Yeah. Yeah, you got to give them a goal. I mean, um, somewhere where some direction come up with preventative measures where that would be for bicycle safety and guidelines for events in rutherford county yep okay that, mm -hmm. that gives them somewhere to go right mm -hmm. <clears throat> i'm just wondering if there's a permit process that metro does for an event like that well i know the city of murphy has a parade permit if you have to fill out it goes yeah. before the uh, uh the city manager to go before the chief of police. Well, that's what this committee can do too. I mean, look mm -hmm. into it and see yeah. if they want it to, as a recommendation. What do they do? Like the run they do up here? Is, is there a permit process or something that's done for that? I, I think there is. I know. I know. When, like uh, Blackman High School had a their homecoming parade. They had to get a, a parade permit and go through the process where right they know the route that they're going. And, Anytime you're going to have yeah. another half on the use of city streets or public property, they have to go through uh, the city of Murphy for permission. And it's for safety measures and stuff. It's, it, it's not, there's not a fee. It's just for safety measures. Which this would be kind of like that. Are there roads, Gary? Are there roads that's dedicated for bike? Pass it's in, I mean, in the county or, or suggested or anything. I see some things in the city, some limits. Mm. I mean, the, on, on the major thoroughfare plan, I think between the, the county and the city, I think the bicycle club and, uh, and has been working with them to, uh, <clears throat> to look at putting bicycle lanes on some of those roads, you know, uh, where they, they widen them and stuff like that. They advocate those. Has anyone here seen the actual accident report of how this man was hit? For what the road conditions were there? Hmm. See, well, see I, I'm concerned because sometimes when something happens like this, like another accident down on Bradyville Road or whatever, it's not a matter so much of the physical layout as some driver error or something of that kind. And, you know, considering whether we should take this action or that action or the other action, 
should be a matter of first being sure we know what the facts are about the kind of injury. From what I understood from her tonight was it was something where up north they have the uh, sections of the road because of the, of the, the amount of snow and stuff and there was a, there was a groove in there that expansion joint. flipped him. That flipped yeah. him. Those little tires got off in one of those expansion joints. And that's that's one. That's one. The, that's actually one of the reasons I thought the highway department should be involved, knowing yeah. where the highways, you know. Um, but we have nothing here to show us what the frequency is compared to the number of bicycles in the county and all that sort of thing. That's why we're getting a committee up. Well, I just want to be sure they do it thoroughly. Because nobody wants to have people hit, and nobody. But also, the people out where Mr. Williams is uh, were not too happy about having people who were not police officers stopping the traffic, and what? blocking the road, so they could not get out into. It. Well, I'll be uh, knowing knowing Sarah Lovett like I know Sarah Lovett, and knowing Ronald Williams like I know Ronald Williams. I think that'd be pretty. Uh, so, uh, she's uh, she's an advocate for the bicycles safety and and uh, I think Ronald's wanting to have uh, bicycle safety as well and I think they'll, they'll both be good on this committee all right how do we need to, to let these people know uh, what we are Right. I will get a hold of uh, I'll get a hold of Sarah, and uh, I'll get a hold of Sheriff Doug and and Mike Williams, and we'll, we'll take care of. It. Any other business? We stand adjourned. Thank y'all. Have a happy New Year. <laughs>